it used to be the YouTube video view was the most important thing or the blog site visit was the most important, like the sessions. And so like, that's what we tracked. And then all the stuff, social things or the clips we've got, that, that was just kind of extra, you know? This is On Camera, On Brand, a show for professionals who want to look good on camera, but don't have the time or expertise to turn their office into a Hollywood studio. In each episode, Rob Rusher uncovers how professionals can get the most from their home or office setups. If you invest the time to share your stories on camera, you should be on brand. Well, everybody, welcome to another episode of On Camera, On Brand. This is a fun one. I got my buddy Justin in here. We recently connected. I actually found Justin through his podcast, Distribution First. And it was one of those, I don't know if you remember, Justin, where it, you had the episode and it just hit so many things that I just messaged you. I'm like, hey, you don't know me, but like, I love your show. And this episode was great because of this. And you're like, that made my day. And I was like, cool. I think, did we just become best friends? I don't we know. We did. Yes. Anybody, yes. If you want to become my best friend. DM me about the podcast. <laughs> so so for those that don't know, distribution first, you can probably, you know, figure it out. But well, why don't you tell us what that means to you and, and even like how you found that that niche of, of distribution content, not just like the general content strategy. Yeah, distribution first is a form of content strategy, first and foremost. It's not simply like content distribution because what I've learned is Content distribution is kind of the canary in the coal mine for a, a good or bad content strategy. Like as you start to try and get the content out, you start to see cracks and holes, et cetera, in the overall strategy. And a content strategy is kind of the same thing for the overall marketing strategy. You start to see these things layer on top of each other. Distribution first came from this idea of most content strategies work their way down the path with distribution at the end. So we go from ideation, creation, distribution, and promotion. And distribution and promotion typically ends up being a checkbox at the end. Did we post it on Twitter? Did we share it on social? Did we send one email? And yep, we did. Awesome. Move on to the next thing and we're going to create it and, and do that. So I ran that system for years, had a team who ran that system. And I just found that it stopped being effective, especially in the last couple of years in terms of how the amount of time and effort and energy getting put into content is the whole like 80-20 rule, right? Like as I started analyzing my content and analyzing what we were doing, 80% of the results we were getting were coming from 20% of the content. So mm -hmm. it was like, okay, if we, if we just focus on creating that really good 20% to start or focus on creating less stuff, but make it better, make it more interesting to the audience and then distribute that content, get it in front of people. Because that's, I think a missing, it's a missing link for a lot of companies is the idea of actually getting the content consistently in front of the audience over time. And so a great example of this would be, let's take a, we'll take a video. We're on your show, Rob, we'll take a video. If you have a if you have a long form YouTube video or a long form podcast or a webinar or whatever that is and you have 100 people watch that video, engage with that episode, whatever. That's 100 people. Now, if you take that same content, cut up all that content into clips, into shorts, into other things and then distribute that out on things like YouTube Shorts, LinkedIn, Twitter, what wherever you want to share it over let's say 2 or 3 months. Now you're, now you, after you go back and add that up and I've done this, I mean, depending on the company, the audience, all that, you might find yourself having five, 10, 20,000 more impressions on that content over time versus the typical scale of, well, we hit record and I got a hundred people. So it's just understanding the amount of ROI you can get off of that one piece of content and keeping it alive over time. Yeah. And, and I mean, with your podcast, when you started, so distribution first, you said you started February of 2023. So still kind of newer, but with the knowledge you had, was that, was that really like kind of set up? Did you know, like, Hey, every Monday I'm posting something Wednesday, Friday, did you almost have that strategy aligned with your podcast? Yeah. I, I, so I built the podcast. I had done this when I was at metadata and I did this for a little bit when I was at TechSmith as well. Like 
built the strategy, built the entire content strategy around one thing. And so I typically like to talk about that as like a core piece of content. A lot of companies, that's a blog. They build their content strategy around the blog and then expand out from there. For me, it was the podcast. It just made so much sense. A, I love the medium of podcast. You get video, you get audio, but then everything else started to come off of that. And for me, it was just figuring out those pillars, right? And and this is where it gets fun. Like you can ebb and flow. And what I started with in February, I'm not doing as much now, but it's having that system to where out of each episode, you know, maybe three LinkedIn posts, I'm going to get 10, 10 or so clips out of that episode. Maybe we'll post five of those over the first month. And then each episode gets spun into a newsletter that goes out. So now I'm getting like, audio content, video content, written content. And then off that newsletter, that then can get repurposed and distributed. Like I can then take those different chunks and get that back out there. So yeah, just building a system that makes it easy and repeatable. So I go into every, my whole goal was to go into every single week knowing exactly what was going to happen. Like I want to know exactly what I have to do by the end of the week to say, yes, I've successfully created and distributed this podcast. And for you personally, have you, is there like, because I feel like even a year ago, posting one video a week was good, right? If you had one oh, YouTube video a week just a year, two years ago, you would build an audience. But I started that with my podcast. And then it wasn't until I got to like more serious with the distribution of the podcast. And I think it was the same time I started listening to your show where it's like, okay, let me just do this Tuesday and Thursday. And even by just doing that, it, you know, I started seeing, I wasn't getting thousands of views, but it was like, okay, instead of like 60, 100, it's like 200, 300, 400 impressions, but every video is getting that. And then, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen this, but what I love is you get a notification of oh, someone commented on this, and they're commenting on something you posted last week. You know, it's like, oh, wow, that that's still compounding. That's not just like, I threw it out there and it dies after a day. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen that too with different channels or the content you're putting out or the clients you work with. I think YouTube is the the kind of low hanging or like under underrated piece of that, which is like I, I, last week I was I searched something and I found this video from eight years ago and the content was great. It was exactly what I wanted. It was like something about like s scheduling a productive morning or something like that. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Like it, the, all the information was still valid. They made that video eight years ago, you know, and I'm getting that information today in 2023. And so like, that's, that's the interesting thing about like a YouTube, Google, same, like those sort of like channels that are a little bit more long-term, I think have, they're, they're not an owned channel because you obviously don't own them, but they feel, they can have that sort of same feel to it. Podcasts may be similar depending on how, where that evolution goes eventually with like, if people end up wanting to like search particular things. And then shorts, I think are the same thing too. I've mentioned it throughout different episodes and different people I've had on my show, but eventually shorts are going to be searchable. Like ev like they're already showing up in YouTube search. Google owns YouTube. Eventually you're going to be in typing in how do I do X, Y, and Z? And it's going to be a 60 second short that shows up there. Or I, I need information about what? And it's a 60 second short. Just the same way we got used to typing something in the Google and getting that sort of answer box. It's going to be, and we're like, oh, I don't even need to click on this thing. So like that's where, you know, and now we're all used to like, chat GPT and getting answers like the way we get answers and how we do like I'm not going to read a full on blog I'm not going to watch this big old video I'm we have to be able to adapt and move and be able to create content that can fit in that yeah and a perfect example of, of almost like why the shorts for me I mean one I've seen when I started posting out shorts I just my listens went way up and and the views of the full video so it's like I that's not coincidence right it's and I even, I started looking at my own habits. If I'm going to buy, I mean, I love buying software. AppSumo is my favorite website. I need to like delete it, I think, or block it from my, my computer sometimes. But what they do so well is they make a little video for each app. So, okay, I'm kind of interested. Oh, watch this. And then it's short enough that it makes me want to see more. And I think a lot of people forget that where it's, it's oh, you want to give the value and you don't want to just like have someone click on the video and there's nothing. But it's also good to leave like make me want a little bit more, I feel like, you know, or make me want to listen to some more like tips or tricks. And I think shorts do that really well. Yeah. And I think for like, 
I think how we value content needs to change in that it used to be the YouTube video view was the most important thing or the blog site visit was the most important, like the sessions. And so like, that's what we tracked. And then all the stuff, social things or the clips we've got, that, that was just kind of extra, you know, it wasn't really like something we valued as, at least as marketers. I know working on teams, like it wasn't something we truly valued. It was like, oh, cool. We got, you know, whatever. Now I think in a social first distribution first world where I'm looking on social 10 to 20 X time, more times than I'm ever going to anybody's website. I'm even probably doing that more than I go to like their YouTube channel. And I'm definitely doing that more than I go to read their blog. Like I'm never going to anybody's website ever to be like, oh, what's your new blog? Never. And so like, and they could be full every single week. You know, these got these companies, these teams that are just pumping out more and more and more and more content. And, but there's no habit, no trend to go do that and, and look those things up. And so I think as we do that, we have to understand like those email opens for our newsletter that's valuable. That's maybe more valuable than anything else right now. Social content, super valuable. YouTube, you know, short visits, super valuable. Podcast listens, like all those things add up, like, and it compounds over time. How do you define like a successful distribution strategy? Is it, do you kind of have KPIs set up with your client or e even yourself if it's with your podcast? Or is it just, is it sometimes simply like getting good content and just growing the audience and building those views it's a i typically like to go with a baseline to start so like what is happening right now because then you can start to understand the landscape right and like, is that like you're checking their social channels you're like oh, you're yeah. getting these views these website yeah. traffic okay yep. every month you're getting this website traffic but it's coming from x sources you know every month you're posting x amount of things and how many of those are ranking Okay, if they're not ranking, how are you getting content? Because what typically happens is you see a spike and then it's gone, right? Because we promoted it when it released and then we stopped promoting it. And so people are just kind of then naturally discovering it with like five to 10, you know, to maybe 20 views a month. Like it's not much. And I think that is the sort of trigger for a lot of companies to say, dang it, we just spent so much, and this is great content. Like we need to get that out there more consistently and and so I like to do it almost like a re I call it in like a repurposing multiplier in which is basically what I was talking about with that sort of a hundred to 10, to 10,000 or whatever with the, with the views and just adding up all those sources. So just adding up what happened here, how much I have this idea or this concept that we created the content around typically we'll say a blog post, a video, whatever. And what is the impact, the total impact of us distributing that content over a month? I mean, a month is maybe the most basic level, right? Like if we share two or three things about that over the first month, how does that work? And then what types of content were the most engaging? Was it the carousel that we put on LinkedIn? Was it the clip, the video? Was it the longer form video? And you can start to like get an idea of A, not only frequency, but then what type of content you're creating off of that. I did a little bit of a case study on, on I think it was the, like the first episode of the podcast or one of the early ones. And I actually got, and this was just in a two week span, I got a 361 X repurposing multiplier on the content because I had a hundred people listen to the show. And then over time on social, I had, you know, over 40, 50,000 impressions on the content because I created a carousel that took off. I had multiple clips. I took all, so I was taking all this content that was, ba I had a newsletter. So I took all this content that was based around the actual episode and got tens of thousands of more impressions on that content in two weeks. Man. And in your opinion, just since you, you're really looking at these numbers, you're seeing how it goes month to month, quarter to quarter. I kind of know the answer to this, but is it worth doing a big distribution strategy without video content? Like to you, how important is video in terms of like a tool in this distribution process to get your message out? You absolutely can. You absolutely can. I mean, yes, I'm not going to sit here and say you must do video. But I think when you're talking about the repurpose ability, you know, that's not really a word, but like how easy it is to repurpose something into different uh, video is just so easy. Like you, you get a transcript, you get to plan out the sections for a video or for like, 
you can think about how to turn that video script into a blog post or that those four things that you talked about into a LinkedIn post or a carousel or do, like I just think the the natural ability to have this thing that's already audio, already video, all the things that can come off of it, it just makes it kind of a gold mine to be able to to distribute and repurpose. Yeah, and at least for me, like sometimes I can just jump in and do a quick video, but the good the good content starts with writing for me. It always mm -hmm. starts with, even if it's just bullets in an outline and then I can go. And I've noticed, and I've heard it from your site too, I almost do the opposite of what you've said. And maybe we can dive into that where you found that maybe a company doesn't do a lot of video first. And instead of them just writing new content, trying these all these videos, I remember you telling, talking about going in there, what was your highest performing blogs, articles, web pages? finding out what it is in there and then creating just little shorts from there almost as like a test. Is that correct? I'll let you kind of kind of run with that. But I, I thought that was great. And that that's helped me a lot to say, you know, I don't have to record a 30, 45 hour long video here. Maybe I'll get there, but maybe I could just record a couple shorts, throw them out and then see which one people like and then expand on that. But I thought you had a great idea of how to do that from from blogs. Yeah, you can do it. You can do it from in multiple ways. When I ran the strategy before, I mean, shorts were ba were barely even scratching the surface, and so we didn't even really even do it with shorts. But I think a, a smart play now, is, so many blogs are in sort of that how to, you know, like that like stuff. Like we create things that people are already searching, and so you got all these blog posts about how to do X, Y, and Z. You basically have the script outlined you know, with, with your sections and all that stuff. And so it's like just taking those bits and like formatting it into a script that you can then record and then add, you know, B-roll of the software over it because you probably already have the screenshots in the post or, you know, you, you, there's ways to sort of, you, you basically already have your script outlined and your storyboard roughly put together for for this video. And then from there taking, whether that's a, maybe a three minute video that goes on YouTube how do you then, knowing ahead of time, can then sit down and also edit it for a short, potentially? So there, there's an option there. Or you just go str cut out that three-minute video and just say, how do I turn this, you know, how-to blog content into a short that I can get out there? And then it can be, you can be as authentic or as raw as you want. It doesn't have to be super polished if it's a short, right? Like you could literally, you know, selfie cam over to like screenshot, you know, screen recording back to selfie cam and it could be pretty raw. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to get too caught up. I think that looking great and having some fancy things can definitely help. But in the beginning, I, even me, I'm just a proponent. It's like, you just got to do it. You need to shoot some stuff, make some mistakes because camera is a different beast and you'll end up misrecording something or bumping the, you know, things just happen. So I feel like the more you do it, were you into video before your podcast? Like, or did, yeah. So you already kind of had an idea. You knew what you're doing and was there any question of whether you would do a video podcast or just audio? Or did you know it's got to be both? No, I knew it had to be both. I knew it had to be both. And it was really because of that distribution aspect and being able to repurpose that content. Because even though I'm not doing YouTube yet, I have months of content just sitting in the backlog ready to roll if and when I need to. And I know it's evergreen. It's not dependent on it being recorded in February, you know, that I could launch that next February and it's going to be, and it's yeah. still going to be valuable, interesting content. And so I think like understanding that from a creation standpoint is freeing. It's hard sometimes I think with, uh, you know, something's not new to you. It feels, eh, it feels stale. It feels like somebody already knows this. It feels like I've already been talking about this. But the one thing that I found out is the more you grab into that old, you know, that kind of old bag that you have laying around and get that stuff back out there. If you're building an audience, you're consi that that's part of it, right? Like if, if you are trending upward to growing an audience, there are new people coming in every day who have never seen that stuff or never heard that message. And so, yes, there are going to be people in your audience who are like, oh, gosh, like Justin, will you just talk about something else? But if that's the case, you know, that's cool. They're free to leave the audience. I do that all the time with creators and stuff. It's like, I might be really into something for a while, love that content. And then I'm like, okay, I've got my use out of it. I'm going to move on and, 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 you know, level up or just go off of something else. And that's okay. I do it all the time. I, why should I expect my audience to be any different? Yeah, no, definitely. I, that is interesting. Cause sometimes I found too, with like, even now, just 
you know, years of watching YouTube almost as much as like cable and getting into creators. It's it same thing. And then sometimes now I'm just like, oh, they're talking about something I'm into now. And then I'll start watching the content again more. So it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of fun how it shifts. But in speaking of the topic of sometimes it might feel like, oh, man, why do I want to talk about the same thing or repeat myself? I mean, you have a great example of why that works. You were just saying how you got off the phone with someone that basically was selling you on your own services, like was like quoting some of the show. And you're just like, yep, that's what I, you know, it's like you didn't really have to sell anything. It's just like, yep, that's me. That's what I do. Yeah, it's a value of it. And it happens. It happens a lot, whether that's folks who sign up for the newsletter or listen to the podcast or any of those things. I think that's the benefit of, of I, that's why I love the video show. That's why I love doing it is because I hop on calls with folks all the time and they're so comfortable talking with me. And, you know, sometimes I feel like, especially if they've watched the show or see my clips because they already feel like there's some rapport there. If they've listened to me jabber on for months at a time on any, on any given thing. And that's part of it too, right? Like if you listen to a podcast for 40 minutes every single week, you do feel like you start to understand that person and what makes them tick and how they talk and how how they think about things. Like, I think that's the value of the podcast from my perspective is I can share all those thoughts, be, be unique. I think that's the other part of it, right? Like have your own unique spin. Don't try to be everything to everybody. Like know who you're trying to help and what that is. And the more you can do that, you know, I don't, I don't need, I don't need 10,000, you know, people who are listening to the show for what I'm doing. Like I, I really want to like build a community of people who are built around the same ideas and understand what they're trying to do and, in, and are rallying around distribution, rallying around repurposing. If they're not into that, if they're like, eh, you know, I'm not ready for that or that just doesn't make sense. That's okay. Like there, there's plenty of people out there to create content and, and build those things around. But for me, like having the show and, and doing the LinkedIn content and all those type of things, that's that's what makes marketing fun to me. I don't I don't have to go out and cold email people to try to like, hey, you know, you ever think about repurposing your content? It's like, no, I've built this engine and built this sort of like content it's it's content marketing distribution kind of in the wild if you're reverse engineering it all. Like I'm I'm building the engine that helps supply inbound, which gets people interested and educates them over time. And that that's the whole thing that I try to work with companies and clients to do as well is, hey, regardless of where you're at, whether you're an individual, whether you're a B2B company, whatever you're, wherever you're at, you can, you want to be able to show your expertise, share your thought leadership, educate your audience on a topic and be seen as the, the go-to in that space. And I think doing that, understanding that's a long-term over you know overtime thing that's that's really important so did you find your your niche was that like an overnight thing just one day you woke up and you got it how, no. how did you how did you narrow that down because i mean you have a great from you know you've worked at huge companies you've done a lot you you could have gone in a lot of directions i assume you know with your expertise and experience so was it what did you kind of stumble onto it was it just you know i'm always curious to see how people found like their their lane so to speak yeah yeah, it was definitely more of a stumbling upon. So in 2019 is when I started, like back end of 2019 into early 2020 is when I started on LinkedIn. And it was really starting to like, the platform was really starting to take off. And I would post about anything and everything, marketing, business, life, whatever, right? Like, I'm just, we're going to post. And I think the thing that when you're trying to figure out your niche or figure out what you want to talk about, any of those things, it takes lots and lots of reps. So reps of like you getting that content out there, reps of you interacting with other people, reps of you understanding what's interesting to you. Cause I think that's a hugely underrated thing is like, if I didn't like repurposing distribution, if I didn't really like, if I wasn't passionate about it and felt like I, you know, was kind of like in this spot to be able to help people do that, boy, that would get boring. It would get boring for me. And I think that's a that's an underrated thing. Like you can talk about something all day, all day long, but if you're not passionate about it and you're not actually like, all right, let's get people on board and, and really try to change how people you are. You believe like, in it too. Yeah. You know, if you like, don't yeah. if you don't believe in it, it's going it, it's not going to last. It's not going to last. You're going to get burned out from it. You're not going to find any you're not going to want to post about it. 
You're not going to want to get up every morning and talk about it. You're not going to want to do podcasts about it. So like finding that sort of blend of what you're passionate about and where you see like the crack in the, in the kind of space and where you can kind of fit in. I think that's the perfect spot and being able to, and being able to talk about it from personal experience, I think is going to, is huge and going to become even bigger. So you can't just give tips. You have to share personal experience. You can't just shout from a mountaintop. This is what you should be do. Cause I can go to chat GPT right now and I can say, give me 10 repurposing tips. I can share those out. You know, I can, <laughs> Yeah, but it's much more compelling when it's, here's what I'm learning from this client. Here's what I'm learning from this. Here's, you know, I'm going to bring an expert on to talk about what they're learning about sharing those personal experiences and stories. Here's how I went from being this burned out content marketer to actually having a plan and feeling like I'm not coming in every single Monday, like, ah, my hair's on fire. What are we going to produce this week? And trying to like shift company cultures toward that is, is part of my goal. But yeah, I would say how, more tactically and tangibly, how did I stumble upon this? So two things. One was I was kind of auditing my content back in maybe 2021. And I just noticed every time I talked about repurposing and like getting more out of the content we were creating, people loved it. People were interested in that in that content because I think most content marketers are feel like at one point or another on their on their journey they're stuck on a hamster wheel or that treadmill that sort of like just I'm creating I'm creating I'm creating I have no time for like purpose driven con or like you know mm -hmm. I'm just I'm getting this request in here I'm doing this I'm okay okay I'm just, you know you're just publish 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 and so and I love that and so I think just understanding that as a core part of it and understanding that's what the interesting part was for the audience and then. I was living it at metadata. So we had this this demand event and I went from a team of 10 to a team of, you know, content team of one, me when I was at metadata, the startup. And we had this, you know, event with big old, you know, great speakers like Dave Gearhart and other folks in marketing. And it was like, and we didn't have a podcast or anything at the time. So I just built a distribution strategy around that event like I would for a podcast. And we like blew up YouTube videos. We did social, we did all that. And we ended up taking this event with 12 sessions and cutting that up into like four months worth of content that we dripped out. And what that did was it, all that content got made. And then I was able to pivot as the head of content and start to focus on the podcast and like build out the podcast and build that show because all that other stuff was running in the background. And I could be mm. creative and be strategic and like really understand versus like if I was trying to do both those things in tandem and like, because we stopped doing like you know, lots of the traditional sort of blog posts and all that sort of thing, because we did that engine with, with the demand event. And so, yeah, I just realized it was like all of these things kind of coalescing at once to be like, oh, if I'm one person and I can get as much content out or a pretty decent amount of content out with, you know, an agency uh, with one or two agency help. And then like strategically being able to do that as I was with like a content team of 10 like, okay, that's a pretty interesting case story. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'm curious though, too, with, with your podcast, how come you haven't done YouTube or do you like to post like each thing to the platform? Because I know sometimes using like those tools, I've noticed even with my following, it's definitely drops if you use, if you don't post directly like on LinkedIn or on YouTube, which is really annoying. <laughs> it is. Yeah. They've kind of, they've kind of figured out, you know scheduling and all that which stinks because but no i mean for me it's focus it's it's understanding where i need to be at right now so like starting the business like i have to be focused on a few channels doing them really really well and then helping clients be as successful as possible like build the business build the content engine so for me the content engine is built around podcast newsletter and in LinkedIn. And really like those three are sort of combined. I think next step would be YouTube. But for where I was at, it was like, do I want to add one more thing? Because when I do it, I want to do it right too. I don't just want to throw a link up there. I don't want to just throw a video up there. And then I've got to figure out how to build an audience there too and what that looks like. And so for me, it's just trying to understand like how to make that work correctly and, and how to do it correctly because I don't want to spread the audience too thin yet either to understand like where I'm sending them. Like, do you want me to watch the video? Do you want me to listen to the podcast? Do you want me to check out your newsletter? And so like just building some consistency there for me has been key and and just honestly trying to not overwhelm myself when it's not necessary.
Yeah. And I mean, everyone I've talked to that has built a big following and is like, you know, then going to another platform, all of them say something similar, even either the line like I should have just stayed on LinkedIn longer before I branched out somewhere else or and among that is just like focus on one at a time. Don't do like in video is video is in depth, too. I think that's the thing. Mm -hmm. Like there's there's a decent amount of lift there, right? Like I have to get thumbnails made. I have to do descriptions. I have to, and there's ways to do that and, and templatize and do those type of things, but, or hire it out obviously. But I think for me, it's just understanding like, okay, what's the lift compared to the ROI. And so if I'm spending five hours a week on YouTube to get 20 views, like, is that, is that ROI there? Or would I rather yeah. just go play golf? Like, you know, yeah. like I think like, <laughs> I, I, you know, I might just rather go play an extra round of golf every week <laughs> than, than get 20 extra views. And so, yeah, like just understanding what makes sense for you and your business. And that was for me, what, it, what did. When it comes to like a podcast or a webinar, and I know we're coming up on time, so maybe we'll end with this. Like what, what suggestions do you give to people is like, what's like a base distribution strategy? Let's say you're recording some type of long form video, 30 minute to 45 minutes twice a month. Like how would you, where's like a good place for me to start thinking of how to distribute this content? Love that question. Yeah, for me, it's it's distribution first. So understanding what channels you want to post on or where you're posting consistently. Let's say LinkedIn. I feel like so, a lot of people watching this yeah. LinkedIn is the no yeah. So LinkedIn. One. So understanding LinkedIn, right? From from a LinkedIn perspective, on LinkedIn, you only really have to post once a day. You know, you don't have to. You don't have to. It's not Twitter. It's not you know some of these feeds where you have to be constantly feeding the beast. They actually like. The more you post on LinkedIn for whatever reason, they're like, ah, we're gonna suppress your yeah, stuff it even does. more. It's true. Which is interesting. So, like from there, you're like, the max I need every single week is probably like seven posts. And that's if you go one a day, which is a lot for most people. And so you can like start to reverse engineer that. So I would say, because I think the two things, like let's say LinkedIn and email, right? Like for the for this webinar. And so the other thing I like to think about once you understand your channels is thinking about creating that content as if that you cannot link back to the original source. Oh, okay. Be, being that I have to get content out of here or get topics or get ideas or get clips and they have to be good enough that I can't let people know where it came from. Oh, interesting. And so, so it's not that, about like the call to action on every short video and that. Right, right. And, and, and you can have a call to action. I would actually suggest having a call to action but what that does is it frames you up to create that sort of zero click content where, you know, I, it, you get all the value, but the, the link is additive, right? I think Amanda at SparkToro talks about this all the time, like being able to create content that's so good on that platform, pl I, I call it platform native, like where if I'm scrolling, it feels like it belongs here because I, I'm telling you, I've looked, I've, we've done tests on LinkedIn and when you post even if it's a good post and you post that link to your blog, it just tanks. Like mm. it, 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 it doesn't, yeah. these, these, and I know Twitter's doing the same thing. Like they do not want you sending people off platform. And so I think understanding the platform you're on. So in this case, we'll say LinkedIn and then understanding you've got this webinar. I would honestly like comb through the webinar, either you're going to watch it or you're going to read the transcript or you're going to do some, some of both, like maybe throw it in a tool like Descript or something like that. And you're going to find the, the best moments and best topics that tie into the core themes, POVs, et cetera, that your company is passionate about and, and wants to get out into the market. For a 40 minute thing, that might be, you know, five. Hey, there's five, you know, we got five. There could be more, but let's say like five 60 second clips out of that. Well, if you're posting, you know, three or four times a week on LinkedIn as a, as a personal brand or a company, regardless, you can then take two of those things and drop them for, you know, four weeks. And now you've got two different pieces of content based off of that, that are going out every week. And so you can start to expand that out. If you're doing more videos, you, I think you said two, if you're doing two a month, you can almost create half of your calendar on LinkedIn off of those pieces of content. And then you can start to learn. I think it's all about doing that sort of like distribution mentality of getting it out there. Same thing if you have like the newsletter, if you're doing one, you know, watch the webinar. What are the main points in that webinar? Are there 
are there two, there could be potentially two, three, four newsletters that come off of that information. Again, it's not like, I don't care about somebody reading the the newsletter and then being like, oh, now I've got to watch this webinar. I care about them getting the information. Mm -hmm. That's the goal, right? Like same on social, like get the information off of this channel. This is the information you wanted to get out and get it into their brains. That's the goal. It's not to have them go back and click and watch the original format. And do you have any insights? One thing I'm I'm personally curious about is, is there any type of formula to when I can then repost that video or that blog snippet? You know, like, let's say we'll just stay on LinkedIn because Obviously, if something performs well, you want to post it, but you also don't want to feel like every month is just a repeat. So, like, do you give it a couple months or or is that just per piece of content, I guess, you decide when you could post it yeah. again? I would give it a couple months or if you want to get it out faster. Like, if you have a, a, a video that kind of took off, take the transcript in that video and create a text post about that. So, you know that your audience is already interested in this topic because they watched a bunch of it. So how do I create a text post based off of the transcript that's in there? Like, what were the key points? What was the meat of that? And then you just yeah. post that. And then it's a completely different format. Or take it and create an image. Take it and create a, a carousel. Take it and, like, just take the idea, the, the topic, the content, and then turn that into other pieces of content. So, like, every video, just off of the transcript, you could have two LinkedIn posts and instantly 2x the amount of content that you're getting out of that webinar because you could have one that's a standalone text post around that idea and then one that's a text post with the video attached. And then maybe you do the one in month one and the one in month two. And yeah. And you can just instantly 2x the amount of content you have out of there. Yeah. Well, I've even seen people with live streams and it, it I mean, it works for me. I notice it's, you know, there might be a video clip I see, then there's like a text post that says something about it. And then sometimes it's just the thumbnail. It's not the video, but it's just that image with another similar text post, like as a reminder, this is happening. So yeah, that I think that's a great way too. just to, you could almost like if you're announcing something, you hmm. can then use that in different, you know, the one piece that you know will work well, and then just cut that in different ways for that same platform too, which I think is really smart. I feel like even myself, Sometimes it's like, okay, cool, I got this. Now how do I post it everywhere else versus like how could I redistribute the same thing on LinkedIn and just stay here? And I think that's the key too is understanding, like when you understand distribution first, when you understand that you only need maybe if LinkedIn's your channel, you only need seven posts a week max, and that's if you go every single day, you start to understand or if you're doing one email or two emails a week, like when you audit your distribution channels, you're going to start to find that we're creating way too much content for even our distribution lanes. Like this is something I talk about a lot, but but there's there's too much stuff often, especially if you're like at a, at a company with like a product marketing team who's creating stuff and a content team who's creating stuff and, you know, customer education team that's great. Like there's so much content that unless you have really thought out the distribution of that content, you're going to find yourself creating too much to even get it out into the world. And so that's where you can be a little bit more choosy too and understand like, okay, like everybody get on the same page, try to get everybody aligned to say, we've got this versus this. Which one do we want to make this month? Well, we want both. Well, okay, but like we can't get both in front of everybody all the time. So how do we do that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I will say anyone that wants to learn more about that, definitely check out your podcast, Distribution First. I'll give you the first. I'll let you say where to find everyone else. But yeah, definitely, because I don't want I know we're coming up on time. And I could talk about this all day. I love this. Maybe we'll have to figure out a part two or something to continue on. It's it's fun to get into like the weeds a little bit of, of the actual actions and the actual decisions being made, you know, that create the outcomes. I feel like there's a lot of, especially podcasts that will just say, 10x your business and this and that and just write a blog every day it's like okay I, i'm smart enough to know i need to do more than just write a blog every <laughs> day so where can people find you where can people get more information and learn more about the distribution for strategy yeah absolutely i'm on linkedin all the time you can find me just search justin simon you'll see see me on there if you're interested in the newsletter you can go to news.justinsimon.co and you can sign up for the newsletter every saturday send out a newsletter that gives content repurposing distribution content strategy tips podcast is distribution first like you said rob you can find that at distributionfirst.co as well and uh, yeah that's that's where i'm at all the time awesome well justin thank you so much man it was great great having you on the show super fun rob we'll do it again all right see ya 
Thanks for checking out On Camera, On Brand. This episode is produced by Motion, a podcast agency that helps B2B organizations create their own shows. If you enjoyed what you learned, check out more episodes at motionagency.io slash on camera on brand.